Well, it's important work you do when you bring your kids. Thank you for that. And we don't often speak of it, but if you uh, are out and about in the community and you're sharing with families, you would begin to, to hear and sense that we are in a time when there is so many incredibly difficult and enticing temptations made available to our young people at such a young age. And I uh, cannot stress for you enough the importance of you participating and also praying for our FBT club. Um, we have, I don't know that we've created, but we've had a part in the world becoming as it is. So um, let's be faithful to do that. And what we believe will be the answer is a relationship with the Savior, of course, but also the more they study and even memorize. I know that word is kind of an old-fashioned concept that we would memorize the scriptures when we have it available so readily, but you really never know when that could change. And it's not just the fact that we want to carry the Word of God with us, hidden in our minds and in our hearts, it's also because what we think about influences what we become. It's a little bit like we say now with garbage in, garbage out. There's something to that. Even in the spiritual world, the Bible is very clear, <clears throat> telling us that we need to be faithful in studying the Word of God. Well, that's what we're seeking to do. We're seeking to go through the study of the New Testament. At the 1030 hour, we're walking through uh, what is possibly the chronological events of the life of Christ, what happened first, second, third, and we think that way. So we're studying it in that format. And during this hour, we're looking at the development of the church, really the remainder of the New Testament what was happening around the writing of each of the books. Well, we're not really into any of those letters that were written. <clears throat> we're at the very early part, uh, part of the church's initial institution. Now, the Lord Jesus promised that he was going to establish his church. He even went so far as to say the gates of hell will not prevail against it. No matter what's happening in the world, the church will continue to stand. And if you've been keeping up to date with any of the current events, especially in the Middle East, especially in those places where there's a predominant or a very influential Muslim population, there are Christian brothers and sisters who are dying on a daily basis. And yet, the more they attack, the more it continues to grow. I just heard a report yesterday as I was traveling and listening to the Moody Station, another one of our really great radio stations. And they were talking about in China, the government has decided they're going to crack down again because they're arresting the house church leaders and they're putting people into re-education camps and seeking to brainwash them again because they're concerned about the growing influence, not because of its political power, but the growing influence of Christianity because it is changing lives. And they've made the mistake of thinking what we're going to do is just pull it out Beth and I spent all day Monday cleaning up around the house. Oh, it just got to where we were embarrassed. And I marvel, because every year we tear out morning glories. We rip them all the way out, clear to the roots. We spray Roundup on them. And guess what happens the next year? We had morning glories going up the old TV antenna, clear to the second story. It's amazing. Hey. Face it, we're going to have to plant them everywhere because there's no way to kill morning glories. That's what the church is like. 
no matter how many times the enemy pulls it out by the roots, it continues to grow back and prosper and get bigger and better. And that will continue to work until the day the Lord Jesus comes back. And then we see God shift gears and move his plan into another speed. But right now we're down at first gear. The book of Acts is a transitional book. It's not intended to be a church manual. We need to do everything just the way they did it in the book of Acts. It is clearly a transitional book. Sometimes even with the title of the book, we don't really get the, the full impact. Probably the best way to title this book would be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we think this is the Acts of the Apostle, and of course, they're a major character throughout the book, but this is the Acts of God's Holy Spirit. This is that long-awaited day when the Holy Spirit comes not to visit, but he comes to stay in our hearts because we're followers of Christ. So let's take a look here. We're looking at the book of Acts, Peter's second recorded sermon. We know the first one was there when that rush of sound and the flames of tongues, fiery tongues were above all of the people in the upper room. And there was a great, great initiation. This is what's happening and you cannot miss it. And even now, weeks later, the, 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 the community of Jerusalem is still being stirred. I mean, things are happening in a way that cannot be explained. The church continues to grow daily. There are more people who are saying, you know what? I see it now. I understand it. I now know who Jesus is. Not was. I mean, that's a part of the understanding. I know why he came now. I know what he did. I understand what he, is, what he taught. But it's more than just who he was. It's who he is. I believe in the resurrected Jesus Christ. And that is continuing to, to ripple throughout the entire community. Those people who are coming into Jerusalem, they're bumping into this new movement within Judaism. It's not the movement that's gone out into Judea or Samaria or the uttermost parts of the world yet. It's all right here in Jerusalem. Now for sure, those who were there for Pentecost, they've gone. And that's possibly why Paul and Peter had such great success when they went to these faraway towns. Because in those towns, there were people who came up to him and said, I know who you are. I was in Jerusalem on that incredible crucifixion week or during that incredible Pentecost week. I was there. I saw what God was doing. But now let's move back to Peter's second recorded uh, message. We read a little bit of it. Last week, as we looked at the miracle of the cripple being hired. So here we look at the message, and we're starting at Acts chapter 3, verses 17 through 26. We've already looked at Peter's explanation. He said, the reason this beggar can jump and run and shout and praise God is because of Jesus' name. He was healed in Jesus' name. You remember who Jesus is. He's the one you crucified. He's the one that you watched die. He was the one guarded by the soldiers at the tomb. And he's the one that hundreds of people have given witness to having seen him and touched him. And they had eaten with him. So now Peter starts the second part of his sermon, his exhortation. And we start with a divine plea. Friends, Acts 3, 17. I realize that what you did or what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. If you remember how the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes and all of the various factions within Judaism 
had joined together and they had said, this one thing we know, we don't want the influence of Jesus to be growing in our country, in our community, in our religion. So they united and for three years they sought to trap him and trick him and even to kill him. And finally they got their desire when they put him on the cross with the help of the Roman government. I mean, they thought we're done with it. Once and for all, it's finally over with. And now the excitement is greater than ever before. The conversation is asking more and more important questions. And that's why Peter starts off to this group and he says, listen, I understand. We none of us fully understood what Jesus was telling us. So I understand that what you did was done in ignorance. Well, that's a good phrase to stop and look at for just a minute. I thought this was a pretty good quote. Soren Kierkegaard was a man who was religious, but probably not born again. And I think that's uh, sad when you look at his quote. But here's what he said. There are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true. All right, we know that. You believe something that isn't true. Many, many years ago, I was sick, I don't remember, I'm sure it was the flu, something like that. And uh, in our house, we always had 7-Up. If not 7-Up, Sprite, you know, to help settle our stomach. And I've told you before that my mother was, uh, she was absolutely certain because it happened to her once. I remember her saying, now don't drink that 7-Up when it's warm because it'll give you a bloody nose. She got a bloody nose one time, I suppose the bubbles, and she was drinking it warm. So we, I remember she said, you can't drink it warm, drink it while it's cold. Now that's how things get started, you know? I mean, that's how things happen. And you start to believe things that aren't true. And we would say, well, that's foolish. We know that has nothing to do with it unless you believe the same thing. And if you believe the same thing, I think you're as wise as my mother, all right? So that's one thing, is, is to believe something that isn't true, but the other is to refuse to believe what is true. And we're going to hear some of those stories again this week. There are going to be people who suffer incredible loss, who will experience the worst tragedies of their life, and they're going to say, while they were in Florida, I didn't believe the reports. I didn't believe the storm was going to be that bad. So there are two ways to be a fool. Either you believe what isn't true or you don't believe what is true. Here's what Paul said and it's good advice for us. We live in an, in an ignorant world. We live in a world where people have developed their spiritual philosophies by watching TV, listening to music, watching things on uh, the video, listening to preachers on the TV who are corrupt and are not strong in any understanding of the real gospel. I mean, people's in, their ideas are being influenced by all of this deception. And what is our response? Here's what. Paul said in Romans chapter 10 verse 14. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless somebody tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Here again, this echoes the Great Commission. The most important responsibility and the greatest privilege we have is to take this gospel message this relationship with Christ that has radically changed us is to take it with us everywhere we go, to preach it everywhere. Because in our little world, in our community, in our big world, there are people who just don't get it. They're 
ignorant. They've taken this and this and this over here and they've put it together and it's become something that is not true. In fact, it's become a philosophy, perhaps a spiritual or a religious philosophy that is damning to their very souls. So the very first thing Peter says is, listen, I know that some of you did. You didn't understand what was going on. But then he goes on and he says, but that's no excuse. I mean, now you've got to respond to that. So look at Acts 3.18. But God was fulfilling all what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. This is where we come to that part of the understanding of the New Testament that is a little bit confusing. I have to agree that Jesus came down and he offered the kingdom. He says, Israel, if you'll respond, all the promises of God will be fulfilled right now. Because I am the Messiah, the sent one, the anointed one. I have come and he offered the kingdom. As we know, the, the, the people, the majority of them, though they enjoyed the excitement of his miracles and they wondered about the, the, the goodness and the greatness of his words, still they were not convinced. They would not recognize him as the Messiah and thus the kingdom was rejected. And as is always the case, God knows before anything happened what's going to happen because in a way that's too hard for us to understand, he ordains it. And he says here, God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. And of course, he's pointing to the crucifixion. I have right here the beauty of the internet. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, the hardest part is knowing what sites you can trust. But I typed in there, prophecies fulfilled on crucifixion day. And I printed out, it goes on for six pages, 28 different philosophy, or uh, prophecies rather, prophecies that were fulfilled on crucifixion Friday on the cross. It's incredible. Now we can begin to look back and we can see where the pieces fit together in this puzzle. We have the front cover of the box. We know what it looks like. What Peter is telling the crowd is this. Oh listen, I know it's been confusing. But if you remember all the things that the prophets taught us, Jesus fulfilled every one of those. Here's one. It's the first one on this page, and you'll recognize it right away, but it gives you an idea. This is from the first book in our Bible, written early. Perhaps not the first one written, but written very early. And it was that simple little phrase, after Eve had been deceived and Adam had committed the sin of rejecting the word of God, he says here, I will cause hostility, this is the Lord speaking, I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And here is the fulfillment. We can see it now in John chapter 12, verse 31. Jesus was speaking. He said, the time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast down. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. Now that's a vague fulfillment, but it fulfills it perfectly. That Satan thinking it was his to organize, 
presented the option of the cross to the masses and the masses shouted out, crucify him, crucify him, thinking he had won a great victory, not realizing that this was the great plan of God that the father would send his son and the son would sacrifice his life on Calvary. Something that we cannot possibly fully understand. But what a great story and a great fulfillment. Acts 3.19, he goes on and he says, Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. They, of course, did not have white marker boards. If we had one up here, this would illustrate this verse. They did have tablets and they would take a, a little sooty oil and, and water and then they would write it down and they'd mark on a tablet and they'd do their figuring and business and then it was done. They'd take a wet, wet cloth and they'd wipe it off and then they could do it again. It's kind of the forerunner of the chalkboard or the whiteboard. And here's what Paul is saying. Listen, now repent of your sin. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. And turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Whew. What a great and glorious truth that is. I remember my sins when I think and go way back. I remember, I remember them all. And there are times when the enemy comes along and he wants to confront me with, don't you remember what you did? Don't you remember how you acted? Don't you remember how you felt? And, and I'm bombarded by those fiery darts. But I'm told in the scriptures time and time again that when I repent of my sin and I turn to God, placing my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, those sins are gone and they are gone forever. As far as the east is from the west, forever separated. It's not that God doesn't remember, but he says, it's gone in the way that I interact with you. I'm not mad at you. I'm not evening the score. There is no karma for the Christian. There is sowing and reaping, but there's no karma for the Christian because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. And here's how Paul later on in this book tells about it. Here he gives these two great summary statements. Acts chapter 20, you hear me read this often because I just love the way it, it organizes the gospel. He said, I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear either publicly or in your homes. I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike. The necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. A little bit later, in Acts chapter 20, verse 20, or 26, verse 20, Paul again is speaking, speaking, and he said, I preach first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all Judea, and also to the Gentiles. I mean, I've talked to absolutely everywhere the church has been that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove they have changed by the good things they do. There is a, a phrase that you'll bump into, easy believism. I mean, it's been with us forever. And it's essentially this, that you've got various options, options one, two, and three. Option three is you can go to hell and, and, you know, never experience any relationship with God. And unfortunately, many choose option three. I don't want anything to do with God. I'm going to do everything on my own. Then there's option two. Option two says, oh, you can make a, have a religious experience. You can place your faith in Christ by praying a sinner's prayer or walking down the aisle of a church or a camp or, or as a child being easily influenced into raising your hand. You can do that. 
and then live like the world and do whatever you want and then always say, you know what? I remember the day I wrote it in the front of my Bible when I prayed the sinner's prayer. You can do that. So we think, option two. Option one then is, is the highest calling and that is that we are committed to live for Jesus Christ. That we are committed to being obedient to the word of God. That's what God expects of all his children. Easy believism is number two. That I can somehow make a profession of faith and then do whatever I want for the rest of my life and there are no serious consequences. Paul says, no, that's not true. Listen, there needs to be genuine repentance. You need to not just cry out to the ocean and to the waves, oh, I'm so sorry. But you need to turn to the God you've been rebelling against and you need to say, I am so sorry for my sins. What do I do now? Because I have no hope. There's no way to fix this. There's no way to make it go away. And then the father says, I want you to think about Calvary. That's where you place your faith. That's how you respond. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. So here is the divine plea. Now we look at the divine program. His sermon goes on. It wasn't a five-minute sermon. There was much more in between all these phrases, but this is what the Holy Spirit has given us to summarize. And he says in Acts chapter 3, verse 20, Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and he, again, uh, he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. We talked about the crucifixion. This is the second coming. Not in particular the rapture, but this is the day of the Lord. This is when the Lord Jesus will come back. He said to these people, you missed his first coming. You will not miss his second coming. Look and see why. Look at Revelation chapter 19 verse 11. John wrote, he says, Then I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider, rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The army of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God the Almighty like juices flowing from a wine press on his robe uh, on his robe at his thigh was written this title. King of kings and Lord of lords. When he comes back, the nation and the watching world will see him. They won't miss his second coming like they did his first coming. Chapter 3, verse 21. For he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things. This speaks of his present ministry. As God promised long ago through his holy prophets, Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. Listen carefully to everything he tells you. Then Moses said, Anyone who will not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from God's people. Starting with Samuel, every prophet spoke about what is happening today. You are are the children of those prophets and you are included in the covenant God promised to your ancestors for God said to Abraham through your descendants all the families on earth will be blessed there is this wonderful event that has taken place and the world didn't see it they didn't even capture the significance of it and now Peter says listen there's a big deal He's in heaven, this one you crucified in ignorance. 
He is in heaven. And what is he doing there? Well, we know he, he told his disciples, I must go away because when I go away, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And you know the way. And Thomas says, Lord, we don't have any idea what you're talking about. And in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. But he's more than just overseeing a grand construction project. Notice what the book of Hebrews, it was written later on in the chronology of the New Testament. And the writer was very familiar with Jewish culture and Judaism, the religion. And here's what he writes, or she, who knows. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. Here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne, uh, beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. Now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. This new covenant, the New Testament that we study so often. And all of that, I believe, is a reference back to where the discussion started in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Very familiar verses. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testing we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help when we need it most. What is his present ministry? He is in heaven, there, available to us, interceding on our behalf, willing to be involved in every one of our life situations because he understands and he cares and he is in control. Well, let's go on so we can finish these important words. Acts chapter 3 verse 26. When God raised up his servant Jesus, he sent him first to you people in Jerusalem to bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. This God raising up his servant, again that use of the word servant found in, Hebrew, or in Isaiah 53, this one who was so misunderstood, the one who was prophesied to come and die for us, shedding his blood for us. Paul makes that reference. He says, you know, this one, his servant, God raised him up from the dead. Of course, the resurrection. And these final words speaking of how important that is to each one of us. Paul, again, later on in the story here of the book of Acts, he said this to the Corinthians. Let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then and you stand, still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the day on the third or raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. Revelation 117, John saw him. I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. When Paul finishes preaching, the people are stirred. Now better than ever before, they see a better portrait of who Jesus is. They understand he did this for me and it was because he fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. How did I not see it before? 
And when he preached, no doubt, as we see happening time and time again, many were stirred and many were changed by the story of Jesus. There will be an opportunity this week for you to share something of this story. You just watch. It'll be there. The Holy Spirit loves to give us opportunities to speak of our faith, perhaps to another Christian. We never know what our encouraging words can do. Perhaps to someone who is ignorant of all that God has done, and they're waiting for somebody they trust to explain it to them. The work in the book of Acts continues today, tomorrow, and every day this week. Let's ask the Lord to make us ready for that. Father, we're so thankful for this great message that Peter preached and all that was highlighted in this summary of it. And Lord, we ask that you would indeed use us. Lord, we would be presumptuous to ask that you would use us in the same way you used Peter, but indeed, your Holy Spirit is in us and he desires to use us to do your work. Father, we're so thankful for the Lord Jesus because without him, none of this would ever make sense. He is indeed the key that unlocks every door. And we're so thankful. And again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your participation. God bless you.